According to the story, the empire was hollow. The hospital was losing money. He didn't pay the medical supplies. There were complaints about their bad image. So he decided to uh, form health clinics like his uncle had. He had one company called Health Maintenance Organizations, HMO. And then there was another company, International Medical Centers, and it was heavily in debt so to recarry, so they merged in HMO. The Health Maintenance Organization took over International Medical Centers. Then he got politicians to pay him um, to bring in the Cuban refugees. So he got $1 million a year when Castro released the prisoners. 10,000 families were automatically enrolled with health plans in Florida. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, how they got this health care, and no one else in the United States automatically gets that kind of health care, the farm workers and uh, people working in factories. And you imagine coming in from Cuba and going to the hospitals run by Mike Riccari with seed money uh, coming from the likes of Traficanta or Vesco, and then with Nasseger and Sears and Jeb Bush doing the pushing, so that he could pull in a million dollars a day from the federal government, and goodness knows how much he took with him. So he had these contracts, refugee contracts, for the Haitians. Now, I didn't know the Haitians and the Cubans were worth so much money, and he built up an empire on these refugees' medical plans. They must have been the best medicated or the best experimented. And what I'm worrying about is the experimentation of AIDS and how you can use a private hospital to give it or test it or spread it, and then blame the Cubans or the Haitians, and uh, goodness knows what went on. Uh, and how do you ever investigate or go back went into those hospital plants and see what went on at the time? A state investigation began, and as I say, Ron Book, a key aide to Governor Graham, spoke in favor of Rick Carey's company. Somebody else who lobbied for him was Maria Elena Torreno from Jimmy Carter's administration. And Representative Claude Pepper, who was always interested in health and didn't know that we'd ever have a health plan in this country. And he has an aide, Jim Brennan, who was in Cuba. And a long time ago, Brennan was sick, and uh, a, this uncle of Ricari's saved his life. And so he said, yes, they're a great family. We'll, we'll get all this money for them. And so Claude Pepper, the Democrat, went along with that without questioning or how do we know we didn't question? He comes right out of the area of traffic and the and John Rosselli and the CIA and the anti-Castro Cubans. So uh, he's very good on issues of the aging and getting money for the aged. But I'm sure he can't look the other way where the seed money comes and how it's spent down there for different kinds of purposes. Rick Carey named a wing of the International Hospital after Claude Pepper's wife. And then uh, Jeb Bush became a person working for him, and he works for the state of Florida and began to make phone calls that were key phone calls. In 1982, according to the story, Rick Carey's ship really came in after he gave the 400000 to Nofziger and the 300000 to Sears and had Jeb Bush working and his seed money in the Department of Health and Human Services created this pilot program for HMO, Health Maintenance Organization, and each month, the government would pay him 90% of the average Medicare payment, regardless of the patient's health. They didn't even have to be uh, sick or uh, didn't have to be critical. Whatever uh, patients came through, the federal government was giving him a contract worth $24 million a year at that time. And by late 1986, he was worrying because the conditions were that 50% of the patients had to come from the outside and he couldn't attract private businesses, so he was eyeing the uh, big uh, crowd in Florida, the elderly in Palm Beach, Tampa, and Broward, and he used political lobbyists and got exempt from the rule of having private people come in so that he could get all of his Medicare money, and the phone calls worked, and uh, everything was going in his favor. Jeb Bush was quite prominent, as I say, along with these other biggies and the health department went along with him. Now, once he got what he wanted, there was a fellow in the uh, health and human services in Washington named Juan Del Real. He was the government's top lawyer, and uh, he quit his job. Uh, he was making 70000 in Washington, and he started working for Rick Carey and got 325000 right away. And as I say, Mr. Haddow, who signed the waiver for him so that he could have all Medicare, not 50% outside, he got a $38,000 fee. And so this character ends up, and I keep emphasizing it, I'm in a state of shock, uh, 30 million a month, a million a day, 
and Glenn Ford, the actor, was used to make TV commercials offering free eyeglasses to members, the IMC members, if they came in and enrollment uh, shot up and all of a sudden he had the second largest Hispanic owned business in the nation. Now, WedTech was started by a person who had lived in Puerto Rico a long time ago and under the federal government giving uh, business opportunities for uh, those less likely to get a start. Uh, WedTech went off the ground and the Puerto Rican background had very little to do with the profits, the scandals, the scams, the huge money investments and the blind trust that Edwin Meese is involved in. And I'll do more about Meese and WedTech probably next week. So this Carey lived it up and when a member of the uh, Congress, Democrat Dan Micah, wanted to investigate it, he was told uh, get off the backs well, these people, a member of Congress, told him to get off the backs. He had a tiger by the tail, and then his life was threatened. One doctor threatened to fit Micah with concrete boots. And, uh, of course, John Rosselli was cut up and put in a drum off the bay out there, and his life was threatened. And he was told also, another, along with other persons, don't bother Rick Carey. He's too powerful. And at the height of his power, and Congress unable to do anything, and death threats, threats going he skipped the country and uh, went on his merry way. Uh, one interesting fact about Robert Vesco, a person approached for these operations, and of course his name runs all through the Watergate and the Howard Hughes story and Americana. He's so much a part of the Americana scene. Vesco was very close to Francesca Franco when he was running his investment overseas operation. That was taken over by Willard Zucker, the banker for the National Security Council. And he had very close arrangements with Franco. And, of course, out of Madrid came the offices with Franco and the CIA in Madrid, Otto Scorzeni and the team that worked down in Chile at Colonia Dignitad and with Augusto Pinochet. And Vesco was helping uh, at one time to overthrow the island of Dominica to make a Nazi stronghold. You remember members of the Klan and the Nazi, and they had armbands and swastikas, and they were going to take the island and make it the first Nazi island in the Caribbean, Robert <clears throat> Vesco. So uh, this is a person working with traffic candy and the connection of the vice president's son to all of this. You say, well, is the father responsible for what the son does? But no, uh, the lobbyist that worked along with the son <clears throat> for this Rick Carey happens to be the one who was redesigning all the sub cabinet positions in the White House and George Bush, uh, being the vice president, certainly should be knowledgeable about some of those people. If, if something happened to Reagan, he would be taking over as president. And uh, there is Nofziger right in the White House and close to them. And Mr. Sears, the campaign manager for Reagan, and they're pushing for this character down in Florida who had these tremendous profits. And again, it's very dangerous to um, consider the possibility of what could go on in those hospitals. Now, if I, I'll try to get on to some of the George Bush stories today. I just want to uh, remind people that, and I opened up by saying George Bush was flying to Saudi Arabia and meeting there and then telling uh, uh, McFarlane and, and North, wait, don't go to Iran until I come home from Saudi Arabia. And he's very close to Saudi Arabia. Ali North got a medal in the National Security Special Commendation with General Secord sending the AWACS to Saudi Arabia. And uh, Albert Hakim and Secord, particularly Secord, they've both been close to Saudi Arabia and North. And at the time of the Iran-Contra, the head of Saudi Arabia was in the White House, photographed with Ronald Reagan, and he was slipping something like $40 million or a million a week over to the Contras, making our foreign policy, for which we will have to be indebted someday, pouring money into uh, Central America. Now, there were several articles on Saudi Arabia this past week that I thought were quite shocking, considering the proximity of the White House and the National Security Council and the vice president, the president. Um, one of them was New York Times, de December 28, 1987. Saudi king accuses Iran of hampering the fight with Israel. And the article goes on to 